Thank you for coming out tonight, despite the weather. I was quite surprised anybody showed up. I almost didn't show up myself. <laughs> it was really pouring down when I left. Anyway, the uh, <clears throat> I gather some of you didn't get an email on this. That surprises me. Uh, I spoke to our speaker for next month, but he didn't get one either. So he was quite surprised when the, he called me. I'm doing a talk there tomorrow. Uh, we don't have the mic tonight, so I hope my voice lasts through the evening. Uh, to talk on navigation, I was uh, approached on this quite a few years ago and ducked it out. Uh, it's uh, a very in-depth subject to talk about because it goes back uh, way back to uh, early times, AD 150, when the first uh, mathematician, a, a Greek or uh, Roman by, <coughs> by birth actually, he, he produced about 20 odd maps and they were the first maps ever used and he actually mapped the uh, world as he knew it at that time, which was mainly the Mediterranean. They could sail around there and they were never out of sight of land so they could find a way around quite well. Uh, going on from there uh, in navigation, let me, <coughs> this one here says man is not lost. Well, that was uh, sort of correctly, uh, rightly said as uh, he may not be lost but he gets awful confused at times <laughs> and it's quite true. To become a navigator in the Royal Air Force, it took six months of training. <laughs> that included flight time as well. And you do what we call a lot of dry swims. You could do plots on the ground and do the same thing as if you were in an aircraft. And it, it takes several hours to do it at a time. So you got the simulation of flying without getting off the ground. Uh, <clears throat> as to navigation, uh, one of the things, that's thousands of uses. Before we start off, it's essential to know where we are to begin with. We're on planet Earth. This shows you it's not quite circular. Everybody thinks it's shaped like an orange. It's more like an apple. It's flat at the top, flat at the bottom. It's what we call an oblate sphere. The, around the middle there uh, is the equator. It cuts the Earth in half. And I'm going off from here. This gives us what we do every day. We fly around. It's a, basically a spaceship. We get a free trip around the moon and around the sun rather every 365 days. Actually it's 365 days and six hours. So we keep these six hours for four years, add them together and we get our leap year. So that covers all of that. you notice we've got Sagittarius, all the signs of the uh, astrology people. Astrology came along before uh, ast astronomy. So this gives you some idea. What you're seeing here is the sun is the center of the foci. That comes from uh, Kepler's laws of planetary motion where equal areas of arc are swept in equal periods of time and the sun is the center and we go whizzing around that. These were, that came up and I'll mention them a little bit later on. Uh, as I say, with the zodiac and everything there, uh, every time I took a, a star shot, my pilot expected me to give him his horoscope. <laughs> I didn't have the chance to do that. <coughs> You saw the graphic drawing on the uh, RAF Navigator Handbook. This gives you some idea of how we use a means of estimating height and range. We could do all this mathematically. And using the sextant, oops, I'm going the wrong way, sorry. Mm -hmm. oh. There we go. <coughs> this is very early section here, you can see basically his sight line is from his eye to the horizon and then the, this slides up and down the scale and it's graduated in degrees so you can look at a star and get the angular bearing on the star and with your tables you can plot exactly the uh, latitude with, with that. <coughs> this was the, one of the early compasses uh, one of the problems with the compass that we use in World War II, uh, the liquid, when you bank the aircraft, you get a swirly effect with it, and it takes a little time for everything to settle down. This was almost not quite gyro-stabilized, but it was a three-dimensional setup. And uh, you could sight on the, uh, from the back end on a star and get your level that way. Then this way, the reason for this compass was to be able to find magnetic north. <coughs> These are the four plots that the two people created major steps forward in navigation. The first one was John Harrison, and these were these four plots. The 
first one, the second, the third, and the fourth done at the back end. This was back in the 1700s. Let me just get the date exactly right to be on the safe side here. As he was instrumental in changing uh, the way we get along the planet. One of the problems we've always had, it's easy enough to get latitude. You can get that uh, the, the noonday fix, which is one of the common things with the seamen. Even on cruise ships, they still do that. And navigators on cruise ships still have to be able to use celestial navigation in case the GPS system goes kaput. Uh, so, anyway, coming back to the time, that was one of the problems. Over land, you could get your longitude very easily. And we used the Greenwich Meridian. That was a political decision. Uh, Britain at that point in time, <coughs> back in the 1500s, was a big seafaring nation, and it was natural for them to sort of do everything that suited them. And everybody sort of followed suit. The Russians wanted to do it through Moscow, the French through Paris. Eventually, it just settled on, I don't know exactly when, but the Greenwich Meridian was from where everything is measured, east or west of there. If when you look at a map of the Atlantic, uh, at the 30 degree west meridian, this is digressing a little bit, but 300 miles east and west of that during the war, we could not cover that from either Canada or from Scotland or Ireland. So that was a big hunting ground for the U-boats. I'll get into how we used to find them <coughs> even in World War II. But these are the clocks that he mentioned here, or designed. One of the problems on navigation back then with uh, sailing, uh, <clears throat> once they left sight of land, they were pretty much on their own. And time was one thing, uh, speed was another. They had great difficulty knowing just how fast was they were sailing. If you stand at the beach and you're six foot tall and you look out to sea, you can only see three miles because of the curvature of the earth. Once you go up higher, you can get greater distance that way. When they were sailing, what they did was toss a log off the back end of the ship and then they try and measure the speed, distance, how far the thing they could see by where they stood on, de on deck. They could figure out roughly the speed they were going using an hourglass, which was not very accurate. It's like your egg timer. You turn it upside down and the sand drifted on through. The big thing, of course, every day at noon, they would reset the timer, that, turn it over. And that was the method of uh, timing where they were going. Once they got out to sea, one of the problems was that, uh, well, you, in those days, I think, coming down the line here, I get down to someone, I can always come back. Yeah, this is giving you some of the ideas where they were going in, in the early days of sailing. And the big trade was building up. One of the problems they had, they had no control over the wind, they had no idea when it was coming and going, and direction was another thing. And if they hit a slack period in the ocean, they could take months really to try and get somewhere. The problems with the, the seamen are their, uh, mainly uh, <clears throat> lack of nutrition, uh, the lack of good water, and the death rate on sailing in those days was pretty damn high. Uh, this gives you some idea of the distances involved. Uh, <clears throat> let's come back to the UK, I'll leave that for the moment. <clears throat> sailing around, uh, as mentioned, Getting the longitude was a, fact, a fact, function of time, and uh, the difficulty was uh, clocks in those days were not that great. And uh, we've got to go back again in time, and into the mid-1500s, there's a whole bunch of mathematicians and astronomers uh, were working on that same problem, all with different theories, and all trying to use the planets and stars uh, to be able to uh, figure out time uh, that way. And they were getting pretty good at it, depending on uh, who it was. And I'll just run down who they were, just to let you know. You can look them up on the internet. And also one thing, um, you might want to get a hold of a book called Longitude. It's a coffee table sized book. It was written by two guys, David Sobel, S-O-B-E-L, and William Andrews. And they've produced an exceptionally fine book. In fact, a lot of these pictures are from the book just to be able to uh, talk about what it was like back in those earlier days. Coming back to um, names you're probably familiar with, Galileo, who was an Italian guy. Uh, he was born in 1564 and uh, lasted uh, 78 years. All of these people were mathematicians and astronomers combined. And he was studying medicine when he was uh, noticing that the chandelier in his office 
started to swing like a pendulum and he watched that and then got the idea for a pendulum clock. He then got two uh, pendulums, uh, made the same thing and different sizes, they both swung at exactly the same rate. So this gave them a time mechanism and that became one of the first clocks that was used, but not very accurately. You have a problem when you go to sea, the damn ship rolls around all over the place and that upset the balance and also the time. So that was the first guy to be able to mess around with that. Uh, he also did a lot of uh, astronomy, of course, by uh, studying the center. And he came up with the fact that the sun was the center of the universe, uh, <clears throat> which was uh, almost heresy, and of course they uh, confined him for life. But he still carried on. Of course, he was one of the first people to use a telescope and study the stars. With that, uh, <clears throat> he found about three different stars that circled around Jupiter. So he became famous in his own right for many other things, but this is sort of a broad brush on that. Next one up was Christian Huygens. He was a Dutch uh, scientist, physicist, and <clears throat> again, he was noted for studying the rings around Saturn, and he was the discovery of the moon that was there as well, of Titan. Uh, he was also invented the uh, pendulum clock, and the established the speed of light. So it's difficult to equate with what, looking back 400 years practically, three to 400 years, to see exactly what these people were doing compared to what we take for granted every other day now. Third one down the road was Cassini, an Italian guy. Uh, he was uh, around the planet for 87 years and uh, he was a, another engineer as well as being a mathematician and an astronomer. And he was very friendly with the King Louis XIV, King of France, and he was responsible for mapping France. In fact, uh, Louis XIV uh, reckoned that because of him, he was losing more territory because of remapping, and France was shrinking in size because they were able to get more accurate descriptions of the actual territory, and he was losing more to him than he was to his enemies. And then along came Johann Kepler, a German from Stuttgart, and he's the one that uh, basically explained, as I mentioned earlier on, the laws of planetary motion. And <clears throat> as a result of that, uh, we still use basically his uh, theories as facts even today. Coming along, the final one I'll mention is uh, Sir Isaac Newton. Again, he was from 1642 to 1726. So we had a distance of about 162 years where these people came into, uh, not, not notoriety, but into famous history because of what they were doing. Newton, of course, was a mathematician, physis a physicist, astron uh, astronomer, and a theologian. And of course, he invented the law of gravity and motion. And he proved the Kepler's laws of planetary motion. As a result of that, he defined the uh, oblate spheroid of the Earth and uh, the first reflector type telescope and he was the first one to calculate the actual speed of sound. So these were the main of people that were uh, focused on that point and period in our history with the touches on navigation and the problems associated with it which were mainly uh, the fact that we still didn't have a, an accurate timepiece to be able to time where we were and where we were trying to go. So you could find latitude quite easily. You get the noonday fix, the sun always due south, and uh, oh, <coughs> uh, pointing at uh, dead south at high noon. So that way you got a very accurate fix. The noonday fix was quite common. Even when I came over in the Queen Mary uh, in peacetime, uh, the navigator was up there at high noon, <coughs> checking everything out, getting his latitude and longitude. And of course it was critical with him because uh, the Queen Mary used to steam along at about uh, 35, 40 miles an hour, about 40 knots actually. And uh, it takes about seven miles to slow that thing down. And getting it right before you came into New York Harbor, you didn't want to have two Manhattan Islands because that thing would have cut it in half if you didn't slow it down in time. Very impressive ship to be on. I sailed on it twice, uh, once during the war when I came over to train in Canada. And uh, that was kind of interesting because we had Churchill and all his chiefs of staff there, and two people, Guy Gibson, who had just blown up the morning near the dams, and Brigadier Wingert, who started the Chindits in Burma. So they, they gave us a talk on board ship. We had about 
500 cadets on board going out to train in Canada and a few uh, GI guys that were going off to the States. A uh, very interesting trip. Churchill inspected us on the boat deck um, and that was as close as I got, got to the guy. And I was quite surprised it wasn't as tall as I thought he was. He not much bigger than I was and quite impressed me. Anyway, you know, we didn't sort of share a cabin together, but uh, he was meeting Roosevelt up in Quebec. That was in 1943. Coming back to uh, <coughs> the need for uh, navigational uh, longitudinal things, there was a classic example of this, of uh, the need for uh, longitude. Going back to October 1707, uh, <coughs> an admiral, I've got to read the name very carefully, it's one of these long British titles, Sir Grouchley Chevert. And he'd been at sea for 12 days, sailing of a convoy of four ships coming back from Gibraltar. They were in fog for most of the approaching the British coast. If you know that part of England going down into Cornwall, the tapers down, if you watch for Bot Martin, that's the area they were heading towards. Very rugged coastline down there. He got all the navigators from all four ships together and they all agreed they were right on course where they thought they were going to be. Unfortunately for this, one of the seamen on board, he disagreed with them. He'd been keeping his own charts and he approached the Admiral and told them they were off course and they were heading for these uh, then uh, rocky bits of land sticking out off the end of the English coast. Uh, the guy hung promptly on the spot for uh, being insubordinate and of course, about an hour later, they all hit the rocks. <laughs> and the Admiral's ship was the first one they hit. 650, 650 people died. They all sunk. And the others all hit together, one after the other. Uh, there was over 2,000 troops all drowned that day. Oddly enough, the Admiral and one sailor survived their, their ship and made it to shore. And the, ending, the Admiral's ending was uh, probably not what he'd expected because uh, there was a woman uh, scavenging on the beach, found him there, murdered the guy, stole his ring, and then confessed to that about 40 years later, just before she died. So uh, his ending on, uh, was not a, a good thing. As a result of that, uh, there was a great uh, flurry going on, both in France and in Britain. And King George III uh, had Parliament decide, and they passed a, a, a contest to see who could come up with a means of defining time that would solve the longitude problem. And this was in 1714, uh, 17, uh, get it just dead right here, 1714. Uh, as a result of that, there was a guy, this John Harrison, born up in Yorkshire, and he was a clockmaker. And I'll show you some of his things again, we'll get to that now. Just give you an idea of the map of England as it was back in the 1600s. It's pretty accurate, actually, all done. Of course, in those days, uh, your cartographer had to just walk around, so get on top of a hill and sketch everything, and gradually build it up that way, plan your roads and rivers, the whole thing. Uh, nowadays, of course, the evolution, we had balloons that could get up high enough and get better ideas from there, and then, of course, now we have satellites that do a whole lot. But that was a pretty good uh, representation of England. Uh, the, uh, up here, oops, wrong one. If I can get the right button. Yeah. Up in this neck of the woods, uh, this is the, the wash here. And up here is uh, up near Grimsby and uh, just in the Cumberland area up in the north and Newcastle up there. Uh, this, I was based in this section here, which is Yorkshire and with all the bombing bases. Uh, the American bases were down in this section here, closer to Germany to give them better range with the B-17, because they used gallons of fuel just staying in formation. So we were much better off up here because we could just shoot straight over. This is Flounder ahead, this point here. That was the sort of rendezvous point at night. If you're going into uh, northern Germany, that's where we all gathered. If you're going into uh, western Germany, down about here on the coast, or if you're going into the other section, down at the bottom end at Beachy Head, uh, that was a very prominent piece of land that stuck out into the English Channel, run by the cliffs of Dover. So it was easy, easy to pick up on a radar set. Uh, it stood out like the proverbial dog's balls. You can see it quite easily. Uh, anyway, that was the uh, map as it was at that point in time. This just gives you some idea of the longitude. Of course, the Earth doesn't spin around on a 
horizontal basis. We've got a 22 and a half degree tilt. Is it 23 and a half? I can never remember. Uh, anyway, uh, this again gives you an outline diagram with the poles, the equator. Again, how we cut it up. If you can visualize a, a big bulb, a light bulb in the middle here, shining outwards, we get all our lines and meridians and all our parallels of latitude. And this gives you some idea of the amount of uh, sailing that was going around at that time in the 16, 15, 1600s. And of course, as you can see, the outlet stayed pretty close to land, and then a quick dash over there to South America, and a long drag was over to uh, the West Indies for all the, the spices that we could get in, uh, over there. <laughs> the uh, <coughs> sailing around, I've got another slide coming up, I think, Paul, isn't it? No. No. Different side. <coughs> the, uh, with uh, Harrison, he's built four clocks, as we saw earlier on. And the first one, uh, he, he made the first one made out of wood. If you ever go over to London, go down to the Greenwich Observatory, and Paul's been there as well. I've made the pilgrimage done there many, <coughs> excuse me, many years ago. You can take a, a tour boat down the Thames. They'll let you off right there. And they've got all these original clocks. And Paul made a good point, which I haven't addressed myself. They don't sell any models of the clocks at all. But even if it didn't work, just something you could take as a souvenir because these were intricate mechanisms. One of the problems they had when uh, or everybody had when they made clocks to sail. Uh, when you're sailing from a cold climate like Britain off to the West Indies to its hot, you're going through temperature changes to get expansion and contraction of the metals. You've got problems with coal because the lubricants on the mechanisms would thicken up and slow the damn thing down. So all of these things combined, pressure, all made differences to the actual functioning of the clock. Harrison was the first guy to get round that with his intricate mechanisms. Uh, he put forward these things and he eventually won the prize. The prize was going to be £20,000. That's millions of dollars in today's money. And it took 40 years before they actually won the prize. It was, that was the history of how the clocks came into being. There's a couple of things, I, I think I mentioned it once before in one of my other talks of uh, an RAF crew that were forced down on the Malay Peninsula and uh, they got in with a bunch of natives there and they then brought them back to Singapore which is where they've been heading to from uh, Burma coming down. Uh, the navigator was the witch doctor and uh, mm -hmm. all with the black magic as we all like to pride ourselves with. Uh, anyway he was the uh, arrived with his little coconut shell and he had cut the coconut in half. He filled the bottom half with water and the second half it had little notches and 50 degree jumps on the top. He had a little hole cut in the side so he could look in and when he got the water level, even though they were out in the, in the water in a canoe type vehicle, uh, he could get that level, then he could sight on the star because he could see the north star just had due south and then after so many days of paddling, they turned left and they landed at Singapore, which is just about seven miles north of the equator. So that was the way they were navigating around there. How the hell somebody taught them how to do that is the thing that always puzzles me. And it's the same with the Polynesians. How did they find out the Hawaiian Islands were there? Well, they, they, the currents go one way south of the equator and north of the equator they go the other way. So they get a hold of the currents. That would take them around. They get to the null effect at the equator, paddle across that, then pick up the uh, other ones and go down. And that changes uh, cyclically in the year. So, Oh, somebody told about how they found that. I'm a great believer we had uh, visitors on the planet here long before uh, we ever arrived because there's no other way you could know that the Earth was that round and how to get to these other points. Anyway, coming back now to uh, more modern times, um, navigation and nowadays, of course, is three-dimensional once you leave up the ground and uh, all sorts of things happen. So you have to have various means of getting getting around from there so you have uh, I don't want to go into the, how to make all the charts uh, the biggest chart we use is the Mercator chart uh, <coughs> named after that explorer and that's the one we use for normal plotting maps are a different thing entirely they have 
topo topographical features on them, so you can tell rivers, lakes, cities, towns, mountains, hills, the whole bit. And you would use these for just navigating around. And at the beginning of the war, the standard of navigation in, in the Air Force was pathetic. Most of them couldn't find their way around Britain, not anywhere else as a bomber fleet. They'd land at one airfield, ask where they were, then somebody would tell them and they'd figure out how to get back to where they started from. It was that bad. Getting over Germany, they reckoned that 60% of the bombing uh, was in about, or more than that actually, was within about 60 miles of where they thought they were. And the accuracy was appalling. All you had for navigation at that point in time, you could look out the window, you had maps, uh, if you could see the ground, that was essential. You had astro navigation, that was it. And then you had uh, <coughs> a, little, a few radio bearings, not much else. So you're really going by a, a sort of hit and miss affair anyway. So this gives you some idea where, if you know where you are, you can get a bearing on a city. And they can show up even in the daytime and even at night, because in peacetime they were all lit up anyway. So you were getting around pretty well. When we went to the blackout when the war started, everything went down the, the toilet at that point in time. Now this was just a way of how you can get bearings and so you know where you are from it on a bearing, then you have to know exactly how far out you are. <clears throat> this again is a grid navigation, uh, which was in use in the Air Force. Uh, again, uh, not too much. It, it, uh, you're going too damn fast. Even in World War II, we were cruising about 180, 200 odd mile an hour in the normal four engine heavy bombers. Mosquitoes, they were up around 400 miles an hour. <clears throat> this again is uh, getting bearings and uh, how you you project onto the surface of the earth from the earth and all the variations you get with it. This again is the, you've got a compass, you've got three things that you have to learn from here. The true north, magnetic north and compass north. And uh, <coughs> the variation, uh, because of the earth core we've got a, a big chunk of metal floating around in there. Hopefully it stays there and doesn't erupt. That upsets the magnetic balance around the planet. So we can plot all these magnetic lines on your charts and they're all printed for you. And you can apply that to your uh, heading that you've got. That gives you your magnetic heading. And every compass has a variation because you've got metal things in the aircraft and we have to, in the RAF, we always had to do our own compass swings about once a week uh, because the, the aircraft's getting tossed around a bit so you want to know exactly any changes in the metal. Of course, when you've got a whole 12,000 pounds of bombs, that changes the mag magnetic uh, effect in the aeroplane. So you do your compass wing, the master compass outside, all the engines running, and you go to the various prime headings and get the deviation and that, make your deviation chart for your particular aircraft. All very critical that you needed that accuracy on it. So these three things, the, uh, the standard thing was two virgins make dull company, was travel. Uh, true heading to variation, to, to magnetic, to deviation, to the compass heading. I learned that from uh, a little lady down at uh, Newport Beach when she was instructing <laughs> on <laughs> navigating around Newport Harbor. <clears throat> this again, the other thing affects you once you leave the ground, the windy effect, and that's one of the things you're always uh, unsure of. Um, now we're talking now into the 30s and 40s. Uh, the uh, Nowadays, with all the gadgets we've got, GPS and everything, it's almost academic. But in those days, it was quite essential you know where the hell you're going. Uh, once you find out what the wind, because that's changing all the time, and you're constantly trying to find a fix so you can get a more accurate wind for the chunk of air that you're flying through at that point in time. <clears throat> this is speed and time. Uh, this is one uh, which is kind of critical. Uh, a very simple thing that we used to use every day in training navigators. You've got three things. You've just speed and time. If you want the time, you divide the distance by the speed. It's just, you know, that way when you're lying above distance and time, you learn that back in the third, second or third grade. Same thing, if you multiply the speed by the time, 
get the distance. But this is simply how you do it. It's a very simple uh, formula indeed, and it's quite handy. And that's exactly what we all had to uh, learn how to do it uh, in uh, navigation. Going on from there, uh, of course, the speed's going up. Uh, you need your air position. <clears throat> air position, the easiest way to describe it is if you take off and, and go from A to B, you're going at a set distance. If you get up and just circle the airport you, uh, for a half an hour, you don't go anywhere, but you come down, but you've had all these air miles. You've got to know those when you're flying normally, but if that's a difference because you haven't done any distance miles, you've only got air miles. So you have to know that. Basically, we need that for fuel consumption as well. And uh, it's one of the things that uh, people tend to overlook. How do you get your airspeed? Well, we have airspeed indicators, and this is your pitot tube. Every airplane has at least one, some of two. The uh, 117 Stealth Fighter has five, one to, for each of the computers. And again, uh, these are usually prominent on an aircraft in a point where they get pretty pure air going in. Some of the uh, Russian fighters have a pole about four feet long sticking out in front. That way they're getting pure air there's no turbulence on it to affect the reading on the dials. How do we get on with that? Again, this is the altimeter. Am I right in this one? Yeah. The temperature pressure, as you go up in the air, the density decreases. You have to adjust for that for your airspeed as well. These are all just the instruments that are stand on the aircraft. The altimeter now, are they're much, much better than we had in the in the 30s and 40s in World War II. Uh, but that's what they looked like on the dial. You set the barometric pressure down at the bottom here uh, when you left the base, because that's only good at the base. Once you start moving around the planet, uh, that's all going to change. But at least you've got a starting point, and uh, this is one of the things you have to contend with as you fly over Germany or anywhere else for that matter. This is how you test and calibrate the instruments for uh, pressure. Uh, I assume they still do something similar today, Walt, I'm not sure. <clears throat> that was uh, calibrating them all. Again, pressure, all the different bits and pieces on it. This thing here amuses me because uh, they have the mercury. When I went for my uh, physical, when I joined the Air Force, uh, one of the questions the doctor asked me, he said, do you play the bagpipes or a trumpet? <laughs> <laughs> What the hell? <laughs> You're trying the Air Force, not the Army. <laughs> and, that, and he said, he'd had a guy who played the bagpipes, and he asked him to blow up. You had to blow up the mercury and hold it for so many seconds. And he blew this thing and blew it out at the end of the tube. <laughs> he'd spent half an hour trying to scoop it off the floor. Uh, I, didn't, I wasn't capable of that, but it was kind of an interesting thing. <clears throat> Just a, a, a drift recorder, you look through the eyepiece there, and then as the ground's going by, you can rotate these, that drum, and then you can use a pencil on it, and you can draw lines on it, and then you can uh, get the reading off the top end there on the actual reading of the actual drift. So this all helps the navigator, uh, it helps you in navigation. <coughs> this is the inside of it, how it all works. This is another one way of doing it. Uh, just a vertical shot down, and you have a. Whoops, sorry. You have this. You have a scale at the bottom uh, down here, so you can read off. Just uh, you're looking at the ground, and you're watching an object. Say it's a chimney in a factory or something going by. You can just track it and get the reading and get the drift angle. Next one. This is the bubble six. And I use these quite a lot. In fact, there's a. Uh, one of them sitting in the exhibit hall in there. This was the, came in the 1940s, end of 1943. Before that, we didn't have this bit at the front, which is a clockwork motor. Uh, you have a bubble inside here, that's that little thing there, uh, the bubble chamber. Obviously, you can't have a bubble in the vertical plane because nature doesn't allow that. So you have it done with a mirror, reflex it, so you're looking at it through the eye, oops. You're looking at it through the eyepiece here, and as if that's, is that turned around at, the, at that particular angle. That way you're looking at the star, and the aim is to get the star in the middle of the bubble. And that way 
when you've got that there, then you take your time with the watch and all is well. That's the reading of that point in time on the star that you're shooting. Of course, the North Star is the easiest one to find is due north, um, and it's very easy to pick it out. If it's a really uh, bright moonlight night, some of the stars are not that easy to fix or find when you're looking through a bubble and looking through a curved astrodome and then to make sure you're getting an accuracy the dome there's calibrations for that for the thickness of the perspex in the dome for the refraction effect of that you have to take that into your calculation as well and in those days with astro navigation you had all your t uh, charts with uh, almanacs with you then you had to work them all out uh, after the war you're able to cal pre-calculate on the ground where you wanted to take the shot. So you, you then find yourself uh, where you thought you were, then confirm it with the actual astral shot that you'd already pre-calculated. At the front end there, that thing was a clockwork motor, and that would run for two minutes. You can see the little winding handle at the front. When you pull the trigger, that started up, and then you could average out the readings on the star for a period of two minutes. And on the side, on the other side of the uh, uh, sexton, there's a graduated scale there, it gives you angular degrees and then you can get it in fine degrees as well, so you get a very accurate fix and then you go to your charts and plot them out. <clears throat> this again is an astro compass, it's for finding the star, you can set all the settings on it, look through it and then pinpoint it, then you get your sextant up and you take a shot on it. <clears throat> this is your uh, airspeed indicator, uh, I beg your pardon. <laughs> this is your, gives you your air mileage and in the center there is a compass. Now in the bomber aircraft that I flew, or RAF in general, we had a, a gyro stabilized compass way down at the back end of the aircraft and that was very very accurate indeed because it doesn't matter if the aircraft was banking or diving or turning, that thing stayed pretty well vertical so you got very accurate reading steadily. Because when you turn in an ordinary liquid compass, the needle so flops all over the place while it settles down. This way it was fed into a dial in the pilot's instrument panel over and above his normal instruments. It was fed into the navigator position and it was also fed into the bomb side as well. So we had very, very accurate readings of the actual heading of the aircraft. The air position indicator, then you could adjust on that thing there and that would give you your air position which you need in navigation. Then you got your fix and your ground position. Between the two was the difference of the wind effect on you and the angular distance you'd been plotting on the charts that you figured out where the hell you were. That was the idea behind it anyway. I put this in there just for two reasons. The, uh, this is the Morse code, but if you notice the letter A is a dot dash and the letter N is a, a dash dot. And when we had the Again, approaching an airfield, we had the radio range, and we used A and N. We had, if you can imagine, four quadrants, A and A and A and A and, N and A. Each one, once you got into within about 40 miles of where you thought you were being, you could tune it in and then find out where the damn airfield was. But you had to know which way, which quadrant you were in. So if you turn the volume down on your earpiece, you could hear the letters, the sound getting louder or quieter. If it was getting quieter, you're heading the wrong way. So you had to do a 180, get you back to the airfield. Then you could use that on your approach beacon, or coming in with dots and dashes, one on one side, one dashes on the other. That lined you up on the runway. And uh, these were not like we did with the radar Rebecca later on, but it gave you a pretty good shot at getting down, even in bad weather conditions. <clears throat> of course, uh, each air crew in the RAF, you had to be able to do six words a minute. The wireless operator had to do about 18 words a minute. Now, to you and I, there's a stream of noise, but these guys could pick it up. Uh, some of the guys in the British Navy who've been doing it for centuries, they could do about 20 odd words a minute. And uh, I saw a thing on TV not too long ago that uh, Jay Leno had two wireless Morse code operators. They were sitting there with the Morse keys and their sleeves rolled up with the old band on it, and two kids with their uh, GP, with their <coughs> cell phones. Gave them each the same thing, and the guys with the dot dashers, <laughs> what about 
two minutes ahead of them. <laughs> Unbelievably quick for a hundred year old technology. This again is the famous G box that I, everybody used in World War II. Um, this is the scope here. Uh, with, you'd have two time bases going across the middle of it. These are your uh, course control, then uh, the fine, ease of the course rod. This is the fine tuning control here. And this just selected which uh, stations you wanted to log into. This was the forerunner of GH, but I'll get to that in just a moment after we do the O. This is a G chart, you can make your own, and you can see how it's done. You have four stations on the ground, a master station and three slave stations. The master station was st station A, then B, C, and D. And on your chart, you have three colors, B for blood red, C for sea green, and D for deep purple. These were the three different colors, and you could see that because you're using a white light over your chart, so normally you use red lights so you get, your night division doesn't get messed up, but uh, navigators aren't looking outside except when you went and looked at the stars, and then Bomber Command, we weren't doing much of that after about 1940. Everything was going to radar. But you can see what happens here. This station B transmits, the signals go out omnidirectionally on the big circles there, and station A is doing the same thing, and then there's a collision where they all meet. And then you can join these points, at the first one there, and that signal coming in from each other. That's how we got our position lines. And then you could calculate on going back to that screen, I could figure out which one was which, and then using just two of these stations, the B or the C, I could then plot these on the chart and get a very accurate fix up to about 300 odd mile range. Uh, it was dependent on height because of the curvature of the air. But uh, by the time you get to Kiel or uh, down the Hanover Way, there's G charts and the one in the exhibit hall out there, they're pretty far apart and instead of being sort of at right angles, they're very much like that angle. Very difficult to uh, interpret accurately. So the further out you went, of course after the D-Day, we moved the stations into uh, France and Germany. Or uh, Belgium, rather. Okay, one from here. Uh, this again, this response is uh, this is Rebecca. Uh, Rebecca was a, an onboard thing. It came in just at the end of the war. And uh, that was used for accurately touching down. This is the controls for it. And it had a screen. This gave you some idea. This uh, photograph from my chart, from the book. And that's the curvature of the page. These are all straight lines. And you're looking down on the runway here. And the transmitter would be at that end of the runway there, but you're going to land at this end here. So they put in a time delay so that when you were reading zero on my screen in the, in the cockpit, um, I could navigate the pilot down. And you're five miles out, there's a three mile, 300 feet a minute of five. I can never remember. Come down and uh, he would fly that in there. I'd just keep him left and right on the screen, and this was what I'd be seeing down here. The various the blips would be dying, dead lined up there. If I came off to one side, it would show up big and fat. Once you got them lined up, you were right on target. You, you just called out the milestone, and you then fly down. You could down there a couple of hundred feet, you still make it okay under the ground if the pilot had confidence in you. But you'd practice that, so it became a pretty much a good uh, team uh, working on that type of situation. Here we come to the Mosquito. Uh, <clears throat> this is the behind the pilot. Uh, this is a bit difficult to uh, interpret here. The pilot's uh, looking front, and this is exactly right behind them. I don't have a better shot of it, unfortunately. Uh, the G-Box. There's a big metal uh, armor plate behind the pilot's seat, and my G-Box was sitting at right angles to the fore and aft of the aircraft. So I could work it quite easily and the light didn't affect the pilot and the screen on the, uh, a shield on the screen anyway. Uh, that was the G-Box there. This is in the navigator's position in the Halifax. Uh, and you can see it kind of filled up with a lot of good stuff there. Our <coughs> G-Box, of course, is off to the left. You can't see it in this shot. This one, whoops, back we go. This one here with the green, is the uh, H2S. That was the plane, we could use that for blind bombing if we had to. It was a planned position indicator. 
The little green circle underneath was a radar alt altimeter. Not very accurate, you, could, you were in about a thousand feet before you were over the ground. But with the plan position indicator, it gave me a picture, again, coming up to a coastline. If the coastline was off to my left, it would be up here, it would be a straight line. Uh, when it came to a city, it would be much, much brighter as a blob, not good enough to pick out streets or buildings or anything of that nature. But we were bombing areas, not uh, physical targets when you're using that. Uh, up here, of course, is your air position indicator, just as before. This was the uh, <coughs> one here for, uh, it's basically taking the center of that thing there and producing it here. Now this set would be mounted to the right side of the uh, wireless operator's table and he could pick up any aircraft approaching us. It would cover up to five degrees above the horizon, 360 degrees around the aircraft. So you could see all of the other aircraft in the bomber street. <coughs> this again is uh, showing that this is the uh, bomb site computer here. It's difficult to see here because the compass rolls down at the bottom there as well. In back, this is the wireless operator's position, and he'd have that uh, radar screen there. Uh, what, that was called fish pond, uh, like a pond. You could see everybody around him, and you can see his controls there for the radio setup. This switching back to the mosquito now. The pilot's sitting on the left-hand side here. This is oval. Now, oval. Some of you may have heard me talk about it before, but that was the. Uh, two beacons, a cat station and a mouse station back in England. The cat station would transmit a signal omnidirectionally as radar does. And that would go out and knowing the speed of light, which is the same as the speed of radio waves, you could calculate exactly where one of these waves would be over Germany. Now that all the pilot and crew had to do was fly out on an easterly course. They would hear dash at this side. When they got to the other side, it would be dots. And maybe it was the other way around, I can't remember. And I never used all of them. Anyway, one or the other. Once you hit that point, you turn onto the beam and fly that circular course down towards the target, probably in the room. The mouse station was where the bomb aimer sat, and the, just five minutes before they would reach the actual drop point for the target indicators, the crew would be told to fly a certain heading. And then they would do that and then the bombs would be released automatically by the guy back in England. The accuracy of that was more, no more than a 100 yards. That's the length of a football field. That's from 35,000 feet. The Mosi could get up there, and the reason for using a mosquito was because for every 1,000 feet of height, you got a mile range. So that gave us 350 miles into Germany. So that covered the whole of the rural area. Once we uh, captured the... Uh, oh, back to navigation again. This is the Mosi with a 4,000 pound cookie. Uh, <clears throat> this was just a big uh, container. It was 97% uh, RDX. The rest was metal holding it all together. Um, this is the uh, Ovo station. It became mobile and that was it. Just the two transmitters, the cat station and the mouse station. And we positioned these into France, way into France once we got there. And they were used also by the A-26, the Americans used them in daylight because it was incredibly accurate and they could bomb in any sort of weather conditions. They weren't worried about flak or anything. Like, well, naturally, they would be hit by radar and picked up that way, but uh, it gave them tremendous accuracy despite the weather. A very useful setup indeed. And the last slide, that was it. So that was basically navigation as we knew it in World War II. Uh, some of the things that I don't, just in passing, I'd like to mention, uh, Coastal Command, uh, they were flying over water. And uh, of course, out in the Atlantic, as I mentioned, you had that 600 mile gap. It was difficult to reach uh, from either Scotland or Ireland or Canada. Once we made a deal with the uh, uh, Iceland, we had aircraft base there. We also got the Catalina flying boat. Uh, back in January of 1940, the British had a commission came over here to America to buy aeroplanes and they had a big fat checkbook and they were buying up uh, Catalinas as fast as they could because the only flying boat we had at that time was the Sunderland which had been a modified version of the, uh, the old British Airways flying boats that used to fly out to the, 
the far flung empire, the, the Brits all over water anyway. A buddy of mine was on the uh, Sunderlands, they had three pilots, two wireless operators, and one navigator. And he had to get a fix every 15 minutes. And all he had out there over the ocean was Loran, or what I, Loran C, and the odd radio beacon. Then you had to do a, Astro navigation, stars at night and the daytime, you had the sun, of course, if you could see it, because they're not flying high up. They're looking for submarines or people uh, in rubber dinghies or whatever. So <coughs> it was kind of a thing. You could drop a flare marker, then do a free drift wind on that, fly three different courses over it, and each time you get a different drift, and then you would then uh, figure out the actual wind speed and direction. The other one they use, because they're not flying high, but 1,000, 1,500, 2,000 feet. And they're looking for subs at, at that height. You don't want to get too high up, but the higher you go, the further you can see. But then again, uh, when you're uh, doing a patrol with a convoy, protecting the convoy, you do what you call a uh, creeping line ahead uh, flight path. And you go so far up, uh, this is the convoy sailing along uh, all over the place. You do. Formation like that, and you do it. <clears throat> the trick was to do it with the visibility, how far you can see, determined the length of each leg as you went back and forward in front of the convoy, trying to protect them that way. When you were looking for a, a, either a submarine, if you got the information from the Ultra or uh, the Enigma machine, then you know the area that the sub could well be in. Then you do what they call a square search. And when you're doing a square search, you have to con do two things. You have to go into sun, or if you're doing it in the daytime, into sun, or you don't want to do too many different angles on it. You do as simple as you can, and you just do a box. And as you increase the movement of the box, you move forward the whole box. And the, the size of the box is dependent on the visibility you can see. There's no point in going too far down. You want to cover an area and make sure there's nothing in that area. So that was one of the problems that these guys had. Uh, we also, one of the things of course in navigation is the weather, and we have met flights as we call them, flying out over the Atlantic in every damn direction you could think of, and they were pretty dodgy things to do. You weren't like expecting to be shot at, but um, the winter time in the Atlantic, you can get swells above a hundred feet, and if you're on these type of altimeters that we had in those days, they weren't particularly accurate. And even the ones that have radio altimeters were sort of a bit dodgy as well. So you could get down one of those troughs and you, you'd never know what hit you. You could hit the water. So you're doing this at night as well. So it was kind of a dodgy operation. I, I met a chap after the war and he'd been on that thing and uh, he was flying Halifaxes doing it. And he came back, they didn't have a bomb site in it. He had a chunk of ice in the nose of the aircraft that thick, um, and, you know, going from the deck level up to 25,000 feet back down. It couldn't be up much higher in those days. Uh, sort of an interesting side to all the navigation that we had to do. Uh, map reading, of course, when uh, just touching on that, uh, at high altitude, well, we weren't flying that high, about 25,000 feet, were about as high as we could get in those days. But uh, you're looking at your map. You work from the ground to the map, otherwise you get into a position, you're seeing things that aren't there. You're talking yourself into what you're looking for is not exactly what you're seeing. So you do it the other way around. One of the other things I found when I was doing navigation off the north coast of Scotland up into the uh, North Atlantic at that time, I was based up in Lossiemouth, which is still an open base, oddly enough. Uh, with that was kind of an interesting setup because uh, if you get a day, it's a sunny day, and you've got little articulate, uh, little puffy clouds all over the place, and there's a lot of little islands off the north of Scotland, and you could swear to God you're looking at an island, it's actually a cloud shadow. And it's, uh, there's a movie called Tight Little Island, which uh, they made a remake of it a couple of years ago, and it, uh, that's photographed one of these particular islands, and they have little sh uh, small chunks of rock all over the place up in that neck of the woods. Difficult to make sure what you're looking at. I guess that probably happened to Amelia Earhart. But, you know, she was never really good at uh, navigation or instrument flying with twin engines. Anyway, that's another story. And the other thing, uh, difference in navigation with maps is when you get down to low level, because that's 
that's the most fun in flying ever, believe me. You get down to 50 feet and uh, you're in about three or 400 miles an hour, things are whizzing by pretty damn quick. This is much faster even in jets. But the, the technique with one of the best navigators in the Air Force at that time for low level, which a guy called uh, Ted Sismo, squadron leader, and he would flew uh, with Gibson for a while, uh, not on the Danburster thing, but after the war when they were on the Mosquitoes. And also he was uh, flew with Mickey Martin when they did the record with the Canberra over the uh, polar navigation over to Canada from England and set some record with that. He eventually became a pilot and uh, uh, went on to other things. But very interesting navigator, but low down, we don't have any video on that one here, but I have it on the Mosquito. Uh, set up and uh, it's, it's more fun but everything you, you look at the map quite differently you're more concerned with contours of well, there's, if you have maps that have rail or uh, not railway lines but uh, uh, telephone wires and, and power cables those things you've got to be real careful but uh, you're approaching them pretty damn fast and the navigator and pilot and the mosquito particularly you go side by side anyway it was the same in the Vampire uh, Night Fighter jet. Uh, we were side by side, which I loved that thing. It was, well, uh, we were tempted to fly under one of the bridges up in Scotland, but uh, <laughs> it would be no end of our flying career if we had. But I reckon we'd have got away with it because the, it was so low and so small with a short through between the pilots. It was up in the Tay Bridge, the famous one of the famous uh, uh, novels about the thing collapsed during a storm. The guy forgot to calculate the weight of snow and everybody on the train went down. So it was Hatter's Castle, I think it was. A.J. Cronin was the author. Anyway, uh, uh, that's the type of differences in the navigation. Uh, we had to learn all these different techniques. You never knew what type of aircraft you're going to finish up on when you finish navigation training. And uh, when I went on to Mosquitoes and Night Fighters, it was a whole different world there because of the, I didn't have any room to do anything. My chart table was about half the size on my lap. And you had to fit your maps on for the area you're going to be working in. And it hadn't helped me if the pilot decided to go somewhere else. You have to unwrap all this stuff, reset it all. And there's not that much room in the mosquito anyway. So but it was a whole different technique. In the Wellington or in the Halifax, with a huge chart table, well, you could have a it course dinner set out there, it was really neat. But, uh, and all your stuff was easy to get at. Uh, you had a little pencil box with your pencils and your er eraser, which you hope you know how to use, but uh, sharpener, the whole bit, dividers, everything in there. And <clears throat> all very neat. And the mosquito, they stuff it down your legs and your boots, and anywhere you could hide it, because you had no room to do anything. And of course, mainly in the mosquito, uh, other than when you were doing Night fighting didn't need that anyway, but uh, they were under the control of GCI. But uh, for normal navigation, uh, when we used to do low level across country, that uh, was to give us a break from high altitude flying. Uh, of course, the Mosey at high altitude, it wasn't pressurized in those days, so beans on toast was not the thing for breakfast, that's for sure. <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> anyway, that was our contribution to what navigation was like. So, any questions? Of my Voice is sort of beginning to go, I guess we had a, oh, yeah, had a good eye. Yeah, so. Could an airplane, uh, World War II, if you pilot a U-boat on the surface, could the uh, aircraft sink or damage a U-boat in World War II? Um, or the odds were not? Very good, actually. Uh, the Coastal Command, they sunk, well, we used the B-17 and the B-24 as well in the Coastal Command. They accounted for 65 U-boats, just these two type of aircraft. And we had Sunderlands and Catalinas as well. And anybody else that could get out there was with them. So the U-boat chop rate was incredibly high. And they were not volunteers, they were all conscripts. And, uh, and you'd have to catch a U-boat on the surface? Yep. The, the At night, uh, they used, we used a thing called a Wellington with a lay light, L-E-I-G-H. That was a big searchlight on the aircraft and we had ASV anti-submarine uh, radar, and we could pick them up on the radar. And of course, at night, they thought they were in the clear, then the guy would come swooping in, switch on this light, and it was like a daylight attack. And they'd sent quite a few that way. Uh, they had, uh, we had all sorts of things for coastal work. We had uh, 
another uh, Wellington aircraft uh, destroying mines, sweeping mines from the air. Uh, had a huge circle, circle the whole wings, nose of the aircraft, all the way around it, 360 degrees, and that would transmit uh, the magnetic frequencies and set off magnetic mines. So, so the, and then the B-17, we used it, we had about 65 in the RAF, mainly used on uh, radio countermeasure work, but the uh, ones we switched to coastal command were the early ones, not like the one we have outside here. That was a C and D model, and they had the, these big cupolas on the side instead of open air turrets for the waste gunners, and the tail was quite different. It was a much better airplane than the one here. It, uh, could, they had one get up to about 38,000 feet, and it was still climbing at 400 feet a minute. And nothing was up at that height in those days. This is 1941, uh, when we were using the boat in the area. Uh, the 20 airplanes that we bought, that's not exactly a main big bottom fleet. So we were switched to coastal command because of the range that gave them out into the Atlantic to fill that gap. And then the, the more we got and then we got into Iceland, that changed the whole U-boat thing. Then with the Enigma machine and Ultra, then we were able to know exactly where these damn things were. But, <clears throat> yes, sir. Is there any estimate or information? How many U-boats did the Germans have? Total. Uh, at the start of the war, I have that, and I don't have it with me, but uh, I know exactly how many we had. But they, they, I think it was about 1,500 of the 5,000-mile uh, uh, range class, and then uh, I think about 500 of the short range, which was, uh, I think, about 1,200 miles. And <clears throat> they were, because uh, they'd learned their, their lessons in World War I. And you've got to, before you look at anything in World War II, you have to look back to World War I, and the trends that were set then, and they were pretty well established. And uh, uh, they almost won World War I in sinking ships anyway. And they've been pretty damn close to World War II. And then uh, FDR gave us the 50 uh, old destroyers. That helped immensely. And then they helped protect it. <laughs> their shipping, as it were. So that backed us up quite a bit. The Navy, British Navy at the start of the war had more uh, ships than all the other navies of the world combined. In the good old days, the, any trouble on the planet anywhere in the empire, we sent a gunboat and sorted it all out. After World War I, that changed when they decided to keep the Air Force, thanks to Churchill, and uh, then they found that it was cheaper to use an airplane. They'd go out and drop a couple of bombs, and that would quieten everybody down, and, life went on accordingly. Um, <clears throat> leading up, this is getting into another long <laughs> story here, leading into World War II. At the end of World War I, the British government decided there would be a, no, what they call a 10-year plan. There would be no war for 10 years, so there was about a 20 million pound budget. That was split up between the Army, Navy and Air Force. And that's how everything started. We didn't get metal airplanes to the mid-30s. About 1934, everything was biplane and wood and fabric. And uh, in, by, when Hitler came to power, the area had no metal aeroplanes, everything was biplanes, no monoplanes, nothing. And the first one we got was the Hurricane, and that's again another long other story that I've done here before or something. So, we all done, we already do brave the elements and it's <laughs> it, it didn't have much of it, it was wood, right? So it didn't have much of a radar signature. Or and was it? avoid German radar with the mosquitoes because of the uh, wood? It was difficult to get because of the altitude. The Germans had the best high altitude radar, the uh, ground radar, for determining altitude of anybody in the whole war. They were really good. <coughs> but the Mosi at 35,000 feet was pretty impervious until the two, ME 262 came along. And that changed everything dramatically because the Mosley, as it showed you, that uh, 4,000 pound bomb, it could do two trips to Berlin in one night. It's only 600 miles there. It flew at 400 miles an hour, so we go out, drop a bomb, come back, and load it up with another one, and off they go into so a different crew. So the made of wood, did it have much of a radar signature? Um, a little bit, yes, because you've got two bloody great propellers going around there. You did pick all that up. Uh, it was a pretty slippery aircraft, but it, you could pick them up quite easily on the radar. 
So. Yeah. Anyway, thank you very much for coming up despite the weather. I appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> we'll try and make sure you all get the email next time.